Hi, this is Jonathan Oxer and this is my first ever walk time video blog. Now, um, a couple of, I've wanted for ages to do a video blog talking about Arduino and home automation and hardware hacking and open source software and all sorts of random stuff. And there's always been some reason not to do it. And um, I've never had my workshop finished or haven't had time or haven't had the right camera or something like that. There's always something that goes wrong. So anyway, last week I was at um, the Electronex show and caught up with Dave Jones from EEV Blog and um, and Carl von Moller, who's working on a documentary on the electronics industry in Australia. And they were going around with their cameras, lots of expensive gear, doing interviews and things like that. And it finally motivated me to do something about it. I figured, stuff it, I'm just going to get out there and do it. It doesn't matter whether I don't have the gear or whatever. And um, I remembered that a little while ago, while Dave Jones was working at Eltium, he used to do drive time rants. So he had the camera in the car, be driving to work, because he'd have a little bit of time then, and he just ran to the camera, which is very cool. It's just making the most of the time that you have available and just getting on with it, which is very cool. So anyway, I figure that just about the only time I have to do this is walking to and from work. So right now, as you can see, I am walking from work, heading home, and it gives me about a 20 minute interval in which to get some random thoughts down. So anyway, oh yeah, and the other thing I should point out is that in this in no way is any official statement from any of the companies that I represent. It's got nothing to do with Internet Vision Technologies, nothing to do with Freetronics. Of course, a lot of the, um, the stuff that I play with is in relation to those companies anyway, but um, these are entirely my own opinions and whatever I want to say. So, the most topical thing at the moment is the announcement a couple of days ago of the new um, Arduino Due model which is um, going to be coming out fairly soon and um, I've been talking to a number of people over probably the last two years about what is the natural evolution for the Arduino platform in terms of hardware because what we're seeing is microcontrollers getting much faster you can buy very powerful very cheap microcontrollers um, by which I mean, you know, 32-bit systems that run quite fast. The sort of thing that a few years ago, you, know, you would have been pretty chuffed to have a desktop that ran that fast, and now they're microcontrollers running phones and things. So, um, what is the future for the platform? Anyway, um, after a number of these discussions, the conclusion that I came to was that the next logical thing to do would be to go for something like the AVR32, which is a 32-bit, obviously, microcontroller from um, Atmel. And it seems like the logical successor to the, um, the AT Mega series, like the 328 and the 1280 and the 2560 that have been used so far. So my expectation had been that at some point we would see a new official Arduino come out running something like an AVR32. And so the announcement of the, of the Cortex M3 based system came as a bit of a surprise to me. And at first I couldn't quite see where it was coming from, but having looked into it a bit further, it actually makes a hell of a lot of sense. Um, the thing is that the AVR32 is not re doesn't really share any architecture at all with the rest of the AT Mega, like the AT Mega series, like the 328. So you really don't get any benefit in terms of, uh, it's not like a, a simple thing, we've got an 8-bit MCU and now we're going to a 32-bit version of the same thing, so you've got minimal porting issues. It's actually a totally different system. So you don't really gain anything by sticking with it. Uh, the Cortex M3 base system is really interesting. Uh, I don't know whether you know much of the background of the, uh, the ARM series processors, but the interesting thing is that the ARM core, which has been around in various generations since the mid 80s, it was in the Acorn and various uh, machines like that, is licensed out to a number of manufacturers. 
So we're currently at the seventh generation of the ARM series processors. And um, so what happens is that the design of the, uh, the architecture is licensed out to other companies who have their own fabrication facilities or um, fab arrangements. And it's not like a reference design. It's not just a specific hardware design that you can then just copy and paste and roll your fab and away you go. It um, requires a bit more work. So what happens is that companies like Atmel decide to license the design of the core and then they can adjust the hardware design to suit their own requirements. They have to add their own parts uh, to the design in order to make a complete system. It's not just a ready to go design. And the result is that you can have a core which you can scale up to run on um, older fab equipment. Like if you can't fabricate uh, ICs down to very small feature sizes. Um, or if you want to make something that's really super fast, you can scale it right down, run it at low voltage, very high speed, and have a very similar architecture spanning quite a wide performance range, which is very interesting. And it also means that for things like the, um, the microcontroller from Atmel that is in the Arduino Due, um, it's possible for Atmel to add other parts. So they've added flash memory and um, ADCs and all of the other things that make something a microcontroller rather than just a CPU and package it all up in a single chip. Um, now the thing is that the, the ARM series processors are currently being turned out approximately 5 billion units per year, which is quite astonishing. So like the entire population of the earth every year in this one particular processor architecture and it's used in cell phones and um, laptop computers and all sorts of things like it's very commonly used in netbooks something like 23 percent of all netbooks currently ship with um, core cpus in them so it's extremely widespread i saw figures recently that said something like 90 percent of all 32-bit risk processors are licensed ARM cores. So anyway, huge user base, um, huge install base, lots and lots of different uh, hardware platforms that run it. So it's a very, very interesting choice. Now there are a couple of issues here. Um, and this comes down to the inevitable march of progress. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is IO voltage. And this is something that has I've discussed long, long and hard with, um, with a number of people when we were talking about the AVR32. But you can run it with, at a 3.3 volt um, VCC. But then what do you do about shields? I say you've got a shield that requires 5 volt IO. You can't just plug it straight into the, um, the MCU and have it work. You need level shifters or something like that. So what we're seeing over time is a move towards uh, MCUs that are much lower voltage, higher speed and essentially it's paralleling the change that uh, normal microcontrollers go through not microcontrollers normal cpus are going through so they're going from high voltage low speed to low voltage high speed and much smaller uh, on die features and things like that so how do we deal with this jump so we're going from a world where 5 volt mcus are common to a world where everything is 3.3 volt or even lower uh, so we're going to have to deal with different I.O. issues. A lot of stuff is going to have to be redesigned. And this is pretty much inevitable. It's a bit of a pain in the butt, but that's just the way we'll, the world works. The other issue is breadboard ability. The thing is that all of the really interesting MCUs now are only available in surface mount parts. One thing that I personally think is really important is being able to breadboard up a design. Um, that is just going to be really, really hard if you're talking about a 144-pin TQFP package that uh, you need a microscope or a machine to solve them. So uh, one of the things that's so cool about Arduino is that you can start with an off-the-shelf board uh, like an Uno or a Freetronics 11 or something like that for your prototyping. You can prove that it works in a quick and dirty way on the workbench. 
and then if you want to build something a bit more permanent you can transfer to a custom PCB and you know, with a typical dip you know say the ATMEGA 328 you can easily um, fab a PCB at home just you can even use a Dello pen and a Dremel if you want to do it all yourself and then um, solder it in not a problem at all it's quite different when you're dealing with uh, with very dense parts and some of these are even moving to um, ball grid array packages which is an absolute nightmare to work with so um, IO voltages and packages so I think that even if things like the Arduino Duo move to um, a higher end MCU like the Cortex M3 one thing that's really important is retaining the low end version as well we don't want every single Arduino to be um, an ARM processor we also need you know, the lower entry level systems and of course I'm sure the Arduino team are all over that they are totally aware of these issues they put lots and lots of thought into this to make sure that it's all as accessible as possible to, uh, to beginners and to the, uh, the simple end of the project scale they're not trying to recreate high end systems they're very clear on what their market is, who their audience is, what the use cases are and things like that. So I think we're in very good hands there in terms of their future decisions. And I'm sure that they've been wrestling with these questions as well. Um, but those are just two things that have been bugging me. So um, that's about it for now. I will, uh, I've got a couple of other things I want to talk about as well. So I'll save those up for another walk. See ya.